The old man set up a small box, he plugged some cables into the television, and said, this is what I meant, when I said video games. Hey everyone, John from Nintendo Life here, and today we're reviewing Horus for Nintendo Switch. This review was originally written for NintendoLife.com by Stuart Jip and was translated to video by me. But to me, video games really were the highest art form. This time when I pulled Mr. Silton's finger, I got the joke. But it wasn't very funny. The name Horus has cultural cachet in the world of British retro gaming, and we can't help but believe the evocation thereof is very, very intentional in the Horus developers' part. After all, their game is steeped in nostalgia. The pop culture of days past infuses Horus from his opening nod to Thames TV's iconic ident, and doesn't let up. There is no reference fest though. The wistful longing for what came before and the comfort of familiarity are crucial to his extended setup, a meaningfully protracted prologue to a much grander adventure. Horus himself is an automaton of initially ambiguous purpose, recruited into a wealthy family for mysterious reasons and ultimately being accepted as one of them. It's a cozy, friendly introduction, impeccably paced and choreographed for the emotional moments of the storytelling to have a powerful impact when they need to. There's surprisingly little gameplay in the first hour, but everything that's there is well written, charming as you like, and ceaselessly entertaining. The story fosters intrigue without being unnecessarily cryptic, is humorous without being crass or desperate, and portions out its emotional beats so skillfully that its moments of gravitas feel entirely earned and all the more powerful. The extensive and masterful use of classical music doesn't hurt. We've talked a fair amount about the storytelling, but not the gameplay, which may raise red flags for some of you. Don't worry, Horace plays like a dream to match its frankly majestic use of extremely expressive sprite art. It's a platformer, but such a smooth, intuitive one that it's a joy to play. The physics feel great. There's a weight to Horus that gives his movement something of a timeless feel. Level design is strong, with platforms and obstacles that are clear and distinct. Initial areas are fairly straightforward, but it doesn't take long before Horus acquires the ability to run on walls and ceilings, transforming the way you navigate the terrain, the way you see it even. Revealing much about the way Horus expands outward, and outward, would be delving into spoiler territory, but rest assured that his life of domestic bliss can't last. Heading out into the big, wide world, the game takes on more of a metroidvania angle, with enormous, ram-packed areas with a brace of secret rooms full of junk to collect. And we mean that literally. Horus's stated purpose in life is to clean one million things, and this trash forms the bulk of the collectibles. It's not an exhaustive, all-consuming mission, there's way more to collect than you actually need, and it's a neat little gag on collectathon gameplay while also scratching that itch for those who enjoy it. That sort of biting the hand comedy is something this game revels in, but never at the expense of its tone. There's none of the Bard's Tale style, doesn't this trope suck? Well, here it is anyway, pointlessness here. Just genuine laughs woven into a genuine story. On its initial release, Horus's fairly demanding platforming gameplay was compared to Masker-style titles such as Super Meat Boy, but we think that's a little wide of the mark. It's challenging, but only in the sense that dying seems to restart from a checkpoint rather than exactly where you left off. You've got infinite lives too, and respawns are effectively instant, so we never found ourselves frustrated. As you progress, you can protect yourself more than the usual one-hit kill allows, but the game naturally gets trickier and busier as these second chances stack up. Besides the extensive 2D jump and run stuff, there's also a brace of minigames that we would absolutely loathe to spoil, but they take inspiration from classics of yore such as Pong, Outrun, and even a quick and surprisingly moving take on pilot wings. Despite this genre hopping, it never feels piecemeal or anything besides coherent. Everything meshes brilliantly and serves the game's broad but resonant themes. What good is nostalgia if you can't wallow in it? It's a challenging game to review because the story-heavy side of things might not be everyone's cup of tea, and Horace's debt to gaming's past could be mistaken for slavish imitation and lazy haha I recognize that humor that it absolutely isn't. Some stories are worth telling, and Horace's will stay with you. If it doesn't put a lump in your throat, we'd recommend checking that you have a throat. Its expert sprite work makes you care about these flat 2D characters and their relationships in ways that AAA tentpole games often can't even begin to muster. Mentioning no names. The only vaguely negative thing we can say about it is there are so many spectacularly brilliant indie games on the Switch already vying for your attention that we fear Horus may fall somewhat by the wayside. 
If you have any interest in superb level design, excellent storytelling, terrific art, evocative music, great characters, hilarious situations, and emotional gut punches, Horus is a no-brainer. It's moving without being manipulative, clever without being smug, and nostalgic without being a lazy rehash. So yes, Horus is another indie masterpiece, and every gamer who enjoys quality experiences should play it. A masterpiece that owes so much to its medium, but has the strength, creativity, and identity to stand alone as something very, very special. Buy this. We here at Nintendo Life are giving Horus a full 10 out of 10. Thank you so much for watching, and you can check out the full written review at nintendolife.com, but until then, take your gravity boots and jump into that subscribe button, and we'll catch you next time. Bye everyone. After an hour or so, Mr. Silton was fine. He said he had eaten some bad magic mushrooms. Part of me wondered why he hadn't doubled in size.